Dr. is Dr. James Small. He was he was a, a very interesting individual. He he said he he he, uh, he, he, he walked around with with uh, you know all this going on in his mind all the time, always looking ahead what he was going to do on the next project and so on like that. I enjoyed working with him, and he's been a member of uh, Wellspring for 15 years. So he's been, he's been uh, working and, and learning about New Thought for a long time. I'll tell you, the other phys physics persons I knew, they weren't doing that. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's very impressive. And you know, during the, uh, before he did that, he, was, he um, had been somehow introduced, and he'll tell us the story, I'm sure, to the uh, Quimby, what's it called, the, the Quimby uh, Center in Almogordo, and I didn't even know there was such a thing. And if you don't know, Phineas Quimby is the father and founder of New Thought. So we're going to learn some very interesting things today. And also, uh, uh, Edward is the the uh, president of the board of trustees for Wellspring. So we come. He's coming, bringing us a lot of goodness, and I'm very happy to introduce him. Edward. It's all yours. Get these out of your way. Thank you, Tony. Well, good to see all of you today. Uh, <clears throat> yes, she mentioned uh, I was first introduced to New Thought. <clears throat> excuse me, in the early 70s, when I became associated with Quimby Center, which was in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, I was a mere student in college at that time. And Quimby Center was started by uh, Dr. Neva Del Hunter, who was a trance channel. And she went into trance, and she channeled a personality that was called Dr. Ralph Gordon. And Dr. Ralph Gordon, in his last incarnation, was Phineas Parker's Quimby. So, I was just uh, noticing as you said the prayer, one of the first things I heard that was different, I grew up being Catholic, was uh, Mother, Father, God. You know, the concept of the duality of, uh, if you want to call it gender, of God. But at any rate, the other thing I noticed is that uh, Dr. Hunter had kind of come through the unity train and so there were a lot of uh, a lot of things that Unity uh, does now that uh, she introduced. Uh, another thing we just mentioned this morning is surrounding us all with this uh, Christ light. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> I was living in Socorro at the time, and a group of us would journey to Alamogordo every Sunday. It's a two-hour drive to attend service when Dr. Hunter was in town. And she was, I say she was a trans channel, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit more later the other things that she did, but she wasn't always in town, so sometimes she traveled. So it wasn't like every Sunday we drove the, the two hours from Socorro to Alamogordo. But as Tanya mentioned, I became a member of Wellspring in 2004, and I will say that I kind of learned to speak new thought, modern new thought, maybe I should say I learned to speak Ernest Holmes. And so there are things in Ernest Holmes, are, there, it didn't quite always match up. There was a little bit more uh, jargon, if you will, from <coughs> unity than, than from Ernest Holmes. But at any rate, uh, who is this Quimby guy? Right? That's kind of what I'm here to talk about, not about me. And what I want to mention is that uh, you can find the Quimby manuscripts online, and there's also a, a website, ppquimby.com, which you can go to and learn more about Quimby as well. But he was born in uh, 1802 in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and he was the sixth of seven children. So he came from a large family. Uh, they said that as a uh, young child, he possessed an extraordinarily inquisitive, perceptive, and inventive mind. Now, I have a suspicion he probably drove his parents crazy, but I don't know that. And from uh, 1847 until his passing in January 16th of 1866, 
he devoted his life to healing the sick. So Dr. Quimby, as he came to be known, treated over 12,000 patients during those years. Most notable were Julius Dresser and Annetta Dresser, early proponents of New Thought, who met as Quimby's patients and subsequently married. Uh, Warren Felt Evans, who was a practitioner and author of Mental Healing, and uh, Mary Patterson, which we know as Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> the finger I was told. <laughs> all right, so those names that I just mentioned, you will find all in the upper left hand uh, cloud, right? The only one you know, we don't, I haven't mentioned is uh, Mesmer. But what's interesting about this, and I like this version because there's a title to that cloud over on the far left, it's called Healers. If you look over on, uh, just to put this in uh, total perspective, uh, the uh, bluish cloud to the right is the philosophers and theologians. And you come down through there and you see on the far right, we have Ernest Holmes and Emmett Fox. And then from Ernest Holmes, we come down to the United Church of Religious Science and uh, ultimately the Centers for Spiritual Living. Whereas if we follow from Quimby, we come down through uh, the Fillmore's, which you're familiar with, to Unity School and down to Unity. So there's a little more direct association with the healer group for Unity than perhaps uh, Ernest Holmes, although Ernest Holmes was a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins as well. So I didn't know this 15 years ago. I, I don't even know if somebody put this together at that time, but I certainly didn't know it. So it's kind of interesting to see that uh, Ernest Holmes came through the Philosophers and Theologians branch and uh, Unity came through the branch of the Healers. And uh, if you notice, there's one difference, shall we say, between uh, religious science and Unity is religious science typically doesn't use the word God very much. We're talking about spirit and universal mind and things like that. So it's a little bit more, shall we say, on the mental side in the Ernest Holmes group versus the, the healing side on, the, on this. And you notice that uh, very top left, the teachings of Jesus fed actually into both groups. All right, so that's, uh, that's done with that, but you can leave it up. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, you noticed up in that group was uh, Mesmer. Well, Quimby got his early start. Um, one of the disciples or, well, students of Mesmer came to town and gave a public demonstration on Mesmerism. And so Quimby went to that. Mesmerism is hypnotism, right? Okay, you got that. And so he got kind of excited about that. And, it was something he hadn't seen before, so he began experimenting with a couple of his friends and uh, had, had, had a good time, apparently. And it turned out that he was able to do it much better than his friends could. And uh, so there were a couple of brothers that he worked with. Henry and uh, Lucius Berkmar were particularly receptive to his hypnotic influence. And uh, it turned out that uh, Lucius was even more susceptible than his brother Henry. And so Quimby took Lucius on a tour. And what he would do with Lucius is he would put him into this trance and then Lucius would uh, uh, look at people. He would travel out of his body, you might say, and in this trance, Lucius had this clairvoyance, sense of clairvoyance, and he would read other people's minds and he would diagnose their diseases and prescribe herbal remedies and so forth for their diseases. And so he sort of became, what is it they call it with the, uh, um, when you're a, uh, never mind, you know, 
the, the, the dummy I was going to say. <laughs> no, no I, was, I was trying to think of the, uh, the ventriloquist dummy. Yeah, so he became kind of the uh, the extension of, of Quimby's mind, if you will, on that. And then, uh, but at the same time, Quimby realized the shortfalls of that approach. But he, Quimby too, also had this ability, what he called independent sight. But he didn't have to go into a trance and so forth. So finally, he got rid of the young fellow and uh, did, did his own thing. Quimby, that is. And uh, one of Quimby's patients said, uh, Quimby's perceptive powers were remarkable. He always told his patient at the first sitting that the, what the latter thought was his disease, what Quimby thought was the patient's disease. And as he was able to do this, he never allowed the patient to tell him, Quimby, anything about the case. Quimby would also continue and tell the patient what the circumstances were which first caused the trouble and then explain to him how he fell into his error, he being a, a patient. And then from this basis, Quimby would prove that his state of mind, uh, state of suffering, was purely an error of mind. And that this was not what the patient thought it was. Uh, so Quimby's system of treating diseases was really and truly a science which proved itself out. He taught his patients to understand and they were instructed in the truth as well as restored to faith. Or restored to health. Okay. Sorry. His work and teachings were both like and unlike those who came after him. But importantly, in my mind, was he didn't stop with nervous or functional diseases, but more often healed organic diseases. And the uh, closet full of canes and crutches left behind by his patients in his office in Portland bears evidence <coughs> to this remarkable power. Okay, now, as I said, this was in the mid-1800s. I'm just putting it into perspective. Now, prior to Quimby starting his practice, he was a clockmaker and he did a few other things, but he was taken ill with consumption, which we call TB now, and uh, so badly that he was taking calomel, which sounds sort of innocuous until you realize that calomel is mercurous chloride. And as a matter of fact, by definition, it's a purgative and a fungicide. <laughs> So I thought, oh my gosh. But anyway, this is, uh, mercury was used to treat folks back then. And uh, he said he, his system was so poisoned by it that he lost many of his teeth from that. And his symptoms were uh, such that because of taking this and everything, his uh, liver and his kidneys were affected and his lungs were nearly consumed. Quimby says, I believed all this from the fact that I had all the symptoms and could not resist the opinions of the physician while having that proof within me. In this state, I was compelled to abandon my business and losing all hope, I gave up to die. Not that I thought the medical faculty had no wisdom, but that my case was one that could not be cured. Okay, so, so we kind of step back in time a little bit here. And uh, so he said he was, you know, ready to die, basically. And he heard of a fellow who had uh, cured himself of consumption by riding horseback. Kumi was so weak he could not ride a horse. So he thought, well, second best thing, I, I get a, a horse and carriage. And so he got in the, in the carriage and he was taking his horse and carriage ride. And the horse was kind of contrary and wouldn't, wouldn't move. <laughs> so he had to get down from the carriage and get a hold of the bridle of the horse and, you know, get this horse to move. <clears throat> and so he's walking instead of riding the horse, trying to get his horse to move. Well, uh, he, he got pretty exhausted and he climbed back into the carriage and he just sat there because the horse wouldn't move and he saw a, a farmer who was working his field and as the farmer got close to him, he called out to him and the farmer came 
and sort of helped him get his horse started. But in the course of all this, he, Quimby, uh, I don't know exactly how to describe it because I wasn't there, but he, he had a healing. As a matter of fact, something in the course of this and the excitement of it all, and he found the strength and he you know, was able to keep his horse going and so forth. And by the time he got back to home, he was cured of consumption. And he said he is never, uh, he was as strong as he ever had been. Mm -hmm. 170 years ago. So here's some of Quimby's thoughts on disease and healing. He said, Quimby was so greatly interested in calling attention to the power of human beliefs in relation to all man tr man's troubles that he didn't give much space to a description of the natural world. He doesn't really talk about matter and often leads the reader or leaves the reader wander, wondering about the difference between, in Quimby's mind, between matter and spiritual matter. Quimby says that matter can be condensed into solid by mind action, and that matter undergoes a chemical change as a result of mental changes. For those of you who Ernest Holmes group, I'm sure uh, this sounds a little bit like change your thinking, change your life, doesn't it? Uh, Quimby sometimes speaks of it as an error or a shadow, an idea seen or not, just that's called out. So whatever its objective reality and the divine purpose, matter in itself is inanimate and there's no intelligence in it. So in Quimby's theory of disease and its cure, we need to bear in mind that to him, matter was plastic, if we, shall we say, to thought. Thought had complete control over matter. Uh, the ordinary or external mind, which is spiritual matter, is then kind of an intermediate term. And above this mind is the real man with man or human's spiritual senses, their clairvoyance and intuitive powers. And finally, there's a term that Quimby uses called wisdom. And that's with a capital W. Uh, wisdom, making its truths uh, making known its truths. Uh, so this is where man's real identity is. To find himself as an identity in every truth, man should know himself as the scientific man, able through wisdom, through wisdom's help, to banish all errors from the world. And he says, wisdom is the true man and error is the counterfeit. When wisdom governs matter, all goes well. But when error directs, all goes wrong. So as a result of this paradigm that we live in, humans live their life in bondage through a fear of death. And this keeps us sick. And to avoid these fears and troubles that make us sick, we invite all sorts of false ideas and don't think that they're the cause of our misery. So we come up with all of these ideas and all sorts of diseases to torment ourselves, according to Quimby. God, or wisdom, has never made anything to torment mankind. Error has created its own misery. So that's kind of interesting. So, a belief in a disease is like a belief in any other evil. But there are those who, putting their entire confidence in the leaders, in this case it was the doctors, accept certain beliefs. They often say they would rather die than lose their belief. You've never said that, right? When you argued for your limitations or for your beliefs, right? Yeah. I don't know, don't make me change my mind. <laughs> so Quimby says, I destroy the disease by showing the error and showing how the error affects the patients. It's described as being akin to what maybe what Jesus did. 
<clears throat> so Quimby says, I'm often asked what I call my cures. I answer, the effect of science, because I know how I do them. I do not know, yeah, if I did not know, they would be a mystery to the world. So science is wisdom put into practice. To the natural man, it is a power or mystery. So all wisdom that has not been acknowledged by the natural man is called a gift or a spiritual demonstration, not a science. And that the curing of disease it was never really been acknowledged to be under any wisdom superior to the mental faculty or the doctors, right? Curing disease belongs to them. So people have been kept in darkness until now. And how much longer they will do so, I cannot tell. If I succeed in changing the minds of men enough to investigate, they will see that disease is what follows an opinion and that wisdom that will destroy the opinion and make the cure. It is wisdom that will do that. Then the cure will be attributed to a superior wisdom. Okay, this was in the you know mid 1800s, saying when when are we gonna gonna get there? So what is disease? It's simply false reasoning. True scientific wisdom, and again this is wisdom with the capital W, is health and happiness. False reasoning is sickness and death. And on these two modes of reasoning hang all of our happiness and misery. The question is, how can we know how to separate the one from the other? And this statement I think we've heard in other places as well. The truth cannot be changed. The false is always changing. One is science, the other is error. And our senses are attached to the one or the other. One is the natural development of matter or mind, and disease is one of the natural inventions of error. So I'm just going to sort of switch this around and say if, if you have a disease, then there is some error or misunderstanding within your belief system. And so whatever can be, tur can be done to turn this error into wisdom should be helpful toward removing the disease. Now, I'll kind of come back to my less present time, but my history, and that this Dr. Hunter in, uh, at Quimby Center, she made her living by doing past life readings or karmic readings, as well as she and some other people, well, I'll just say that when she did these readings, she again would go into a trance and then Dr. Gordon would come through and, and give the reading for, for the person. But as a course of this wisdom that she gleaned from that, she and others developed uh, aura balancing. And everybody here knows what an aura is? Yes, okay. Uh, it's now been kind of renamed Noetic Balancing, and there's a group in Santa Fe that does this that has sort of been, uh, uh, were her past students and had moved up there. And uh, You can look it up on, online and so forth, but it's called Noetic Balancing now. Uh, but she had her teachings and learning from uh, Quimby and the idea of the human energy field and the idea of errors and judgment thinking that which actually show up in your energy field. And she combined that with uh, John Clark McDougall who used a pendulum. And so they developed this uh, aura balancing which basically the uh, client would come lay down on a table and then using the pendulum through the auric field well the way it works is the pendulum hits these blockages and through a combination of intuition of the uh, uh, client and the balancer the blockage comes to light the source of the blockage comes to light and as uh, I had actually spent a great number of hours in the balancing room, either uh, mostly holding the light for the, for the team. But, and I've also had my work balance, let's put it that way. And so speaking from that perspective, ultimately my goal became this, that as I was being balanced, 
a blockage is hit, if you will, by the pendulum. And my job was to acknowledge, in essence, the first thing that came to mind, that that might have some significance. Because I often had the other aspect of it, which was, no, it couldn't be that. No, because it's not that. You know? And they would say, well, you know, it might be something associated with this. And it's like, um, yeah, maybe. And it's sort of over here was this word or this thought. It's like, well, it couldn't be that, really. You know? And then, so we, we finally work around. It's like, that's what it was. And lo and behold, that's, that's what it was. So after a while, it became my job to uh, um, follow my intuition as quickly as possible. In some cases, it didn't even have to be verbalized as what was going on. But the other thing that was added by all of this was the concept of self-forgiveness. Because of the blockage was what? An error in thinking or a misunderstanding. Now we always think of self-forgiveness as something, well, why should I forgive myself? I haven't done anything wrong. You know, I'm right, I see some chuckles back there. <laughs> Needing to forgive yourself doesn't have anything to do with being a bad or a good person. It's all a matter of you experienced a misunderstanding or false reasoning. And anyway, this blockage in the, in the aura, sometimes it was associated with an actual physical malady, if you will, and sometimes it was associated with something that had not manifested yet. So, you know, there you have it. You can, uh, you can work on things in the auric field before they become in the human body. So I just want to, I'm going to quickly run through a little bit here because this is what I'll call my pet peeve. Uh, you know, we talked about, doesn't have to be back up there, we talked about the early healers, right? Well, a hundred and some years ago, people were healing physical maladies. Well, that just was Quimby, but, you know, we know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was healing physical maladies. People go to Lourdes and are healed of physical maladies. Where have we lost it? We're still the same human beings, the same Christ stuff, same God stuff. Our bodies are still, we still have an aura. You know, we still got all, same, same folks. Well, I just want to leave you with a couple things here that uh, physicians say that fully 50% of the problems in the acute stages of illness and 75% of the difficulties of convalescence have their primary origin not in the body, but in the mind of the patient. Physicians say this, right? And, you know, Western medicine does believe in the healing power of the mind. <coughs> but they don't call it that. What am I talking about? The placebo effect. You've heard of that, right? The placebo effect is one of the strangest and least understood phenomena found in human psychology and physiology. A lot of things have happened and scientists have an impossible time trying to explain them. So just for, uh, for grins, several studies have shown that placebos basically do the same thing as antidepressants without the adverse side effects. Placebos still work even though you know it's a placebo. In studies with the the group getting the placebos that found that they were healed of whatever it was they were taking this new drug for. And then when they were told it was a, only a placebo, they said, well, that's okay, I want to keep taking it. <laughs> uh, you tell me what's doing the healing there, folks. Uh, the color of the placebo makes a big difference on its uh, efficacy. Yellow pills are uh, more effective in treating uh, depression. Red pills keep the patient 
more alert and awake. Green pills ease anxiety, and white pills soothe stomach issues, such as ulcers. Sugar pills, right? The more placebos are take, you take, the better. If you take them four times a day, it works better than twice a day. What's doing the healing? Yes. Pills that have a brand name stamp, stamped on them work better than pills that have nothing written on them. And I love this one because it feeds back into what I said. We've known about the placebo effect in the, seven, as, uh, the late 1700s. In 1990, only 5% of chronic pain sufferers experienced a decrease in pain from taking the placebo. But in 2013, 30% had a decrease in pain. The more testing medical science does, the more powerful the placebo effect has become over time. I think you can get them down at Walgreens. <laughs> All I have to say is that spiritual healing of a physical disease is possible. It's been done in the past, and in some respects we see that it's been happen it does happen now. It happens today. And I say there's no reason to believe it can't happen to you now. thinking, aren't we? We're thinking with the wisdom, not the error, right? Now, if you'd like to, relax, get wiggle in your seat and get into a comfortable place, and we'll do a meditation. into your seat, take in a deep breath. loving light into your knees and know that you are flexible with every step that you take and the energy now moving up your legs up your thighs into your hips and know that you move forward with ease with joy allow this energy to settle into the base of your spine and around your lower torso Know that every cell, every molecule is doing its job, happy, happy to do its work. And everything is working in perfect harmony. We relax and let go, and we know that all is well. All is in divine order. We let go of mistaken thoughts and turn our mind and our thoughts away from dis-ease to embrace the healing light and the energy into every area here as it now moves up our spine and into our upper torso.
Feel the love grow in our hearts as we let go of mistaken thoughts and we allow our own self-forgiveness. We forgive ourselves and we forgive others. And we ask for them to forgive us. And as we do, we feel our hearts growing with this love and this healing, sending it everywhere within our bodies. And as it moves into our shoulders, we know that we are letting go of all those things that do not belong to us. We're letting go of ideas and thoughts and persons and situations that do not belong to us. We allow them to take care of their responsibilities and we feel the relaxation like waves of this healing, loving energy massaging our shoulders and moving down our arms and settling into our hands, feeling this beautiful energy now in our hands, growing and growing. This white light, pure and free of error of thinking, free and filled with love, moving into our neck, into our throats. Feel this beautiful, healing, loving energy settling into our throats, relaxing our necks, and moving up over our heads, relaxing our jaws, and let go of all thoughts standing in the way of our relaxed jaws, our happy heads, so that we are feeling this beautiful loving energy from the tips of our toes all the way to the top of our heads. And let's take a moment and let's replace any mistaken idea, any confusion, any lingering thought that needs to be forgiven, let's replace that. Now we replace that with healing, with loving, happy thoughts. So that we know that everything within our body, every cell is happy to do the job, to do its job in our feet, in our knees, in our hips, our solar plexus, every organ, every muscle, every bone, and every heart inside our heart, the thoughts inside our minds. We are healing, we are healing, and we are healed. We let go of all that which does not belong to us, and lose ourselves to our own good. Only the highest and best is manifest in our lives today. Thank you, God. Allow this energy now that you have allowed to grow and build within you, to share within the next person sitting next to you and next to them until this entire room is filled, entire, entire building is filled, and we are surrounding this beautiful, sharing this beautiful, loving light of healing with the entire world. Everyone is touched. Everything is touched. We are clear channels. The more we let go, the clearer we become. And we bring the energy back. Bring it back. Bring it back to your hands and your feet. Know we are sitting in the seat you are, in this room. And know that it is done. And all is well. Amen. And so it is. Thank you.